Good evening and welcome to the annual NSA uh, College Arts uh, Theatre competition this evening. Uh, it's good to see that there is a full house tonight. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Daniel Newman. I am the Director of Student Affairs here at NSA and a lecturer in theology. As the college has grown, students are allocated to halls, smaller communities to which they belong. And throughout the year, the halls compete with one another in all sorts of endeavors, academic, sporting, rhetorical. Uh, but this evening, it is the thespians of the college who contend for the coveted hall points uh, to be awarded at the end of the year. Uh, this evening, each hall will perform an adaptation or a selection of scenes from Shakespeare's comedies. After each performance, there'll be a short intermission of about 10 minutes uh, before the next hall performs. And during the intermission, you can buy concessions uh, in support of the senior class. What is a comedy? Is it the presence of funny jokes? Is it funny characters? Is it ridiculous situations? Shakespeare's comedies have all those things, but at the heart, comedy is about the plot. Comedies acknowledge the reality of evil, the possibility of tragedy, but these are averted. Uh, Peter Lighthart has said that uh, while well, in a tragedy, uh, all the main characters end up dead, in a comedy, all the main characters get married. <laughs> in this way, comedies are salvation stories. They're stories about redemption, pointing forward, however vaguely, to the story of redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom who wins his bride. So as we begin this evening, let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, for the effort the students have put in in rehearsing these plays and preparing the sets, uh, for those who have been involved in many different ways. We pray that they would do themselves justice this evening uh, and they would bring you glory. And as we are entertained, we pray that you would point us to the story of your redemption uh, through your son, the bridegroom of the church. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. First to take the stage this evening is Ashdown Hall with a condensed adaptation of As You Like It. This performance stands in a tradition of adapting and reimagining the setting to a different time period. Uh, you might remember the film of Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo Di DiCaprio uh, in the midst of warring business empires and shootouts. My wife and I remember a particularly terrible ending to a, a Valentine's Day evening uh, when we saw a performance of The Taming of the Shrew, which opened rather unpromisingly with a drunken bachelor weekend. I'm hopeful that Ashdown Hall will avoid uh, such a terrible mistake <laughs> Uh, this evening. Uh, originally, As You Like It, uh, was set in Italy, but uh, this performance, Italy becomes 1950s New York, and the nearby forest of Arden become the streets of Brooklyn. This tale of mistaken and identity and love follows the cousins Rosalind and Celia. When Rosalind is banished to the forest of Arden, Celia decides to go with her. Disguised as brother and sister, Ganymede and Aliena, they run into Orlando, Rosalind's love. Orlando does not recognize her. Pretending to be Ganymede, Rosalind proposes a game to him. If he will pretend that she is Rosalind, she will cure him of his love. Orlando accepts, and hilarity ensues. As You Like It by Ashdown Hall. As of no Adam, my, my father bequeathed me but a thousand crowns and charged my brother Oliver to give me a good education. My brother James keeps at school, but me, I stay home and get gain nothing. His horses are bred better. I no longer endure it. Here comes your ma uh, my master, your brother Oliver. Go pardon here or you'll rough me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing. I'm not taught to make anything. Know you before whom you are, sir. I know thou art my brother, and thou shouldst know me. As much as my father in me as in you, wilt thou lay hands on me, villain? Were thou not my brother, I will not let go of this hand from thy throat till the other had plucked out thy tongue. Sweet masters, be patient. Let me go, I say. 
<laughs> my father charged you to give me a good education. But you have trained me like a peasant. In the poor lottery my father left me, I'll go buy my fortunes. You shall have some part of your will. Get you in with him, you old dog. Old dog? My old master would not have said such a word. <clears throat> Charles, the Duke's wrestler, is here, sir. Uh, call him in. She'll be in a good way, and tomorrow is the wrestling. Good day, Monsieur Charles. What's the new news at the court? Oh, just the old news. The old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke, and three or four lords have put themselves into exile with him. Is Rosalind the old duke's daughter with her father? No, she remains at court with her cousin, the new duke's daughter, who, being ever from their cradles bred together, would have followed her into exile or died to stay behind. Where will the old duke live? They say in the forest of our den with his merry men, like old Robin Hood. What, you wrestle tomorrow before the new duke? I do, and I understand your young brother Orlando plans to come against me. I can warn you, sir, he may not escape without some broken limb. <laughs> he is a young villain. I'd as lief thou didst break his neck. If ever he go alone again, I'll never wrestle more. God keep your worship. I hate my brother. I know not why. This wrestler shall clear all. Oh, I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet, my cause be merry. Dear Celia, how can I forget my banished father? When my father dies, I will render thee what he hath taken from thy father. Bonjour, Monsieur de Beau. What's the news? Fair princess, you have lost much fair sport. Sport? Of what color? The wrestling. Tell us the manner of it. I will tell you the beginning, and you may see the end. For the best is yet to come. Well, wow, tell us the beginning. An old man and his three sons came. The eldest wrestled Sir Charles, who broke three of his ribs so that there's little hope of life left in him. <laughs> and so he dispatched the second and third. Alas, but what is the sport, Monsieur, that we have lost? Why, this son I speak of. <laughs> Tis the first time I ever heard that breaking of ribs was a sport for ladies. Shall we see it, cousin? You must, you must, for here is the place appointed. Charles is wrestling another young challenger. Hmm. Yonder, they are coming. Let us stay and see it. His youth will not be entreated, his own peril on his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Even he hath. Alas, he is too young. How oh, now, daughter and cousin, are you come hither to see the wrestling? I, my liege. You will take little delight in it. There's such odds in the young man. I tried to dissuade the young challenger, but you will not be entreated. See if you can move him. Call him hither, good Monsieur Le Beau. Monsieur, the princess comes to me. I attend them with all respect. Uh, young man, you have seen cruel proof of this man's strength. We pray you, give over the attempt. I would not deny such fair ladies anything. But if I be slain, I'll do my friends no wrong, for I have none. Come, where is this young gallant who is so desirous to lie with Mother Earth? Ready, sir. You shall try but one fall. I warrant your grace, you need not entreat him to a second. You mean to mock me? Come your ways. Hercules be thy speed, young man! Oh. Excellent young man! <laughs> no more! No more! I beseech my grace, I am not well breathed. How dost thou, Charles? He cannot speak. Fair <laughs> boy. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my liege, youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. Would that thou hadst been son to some man else. But fare thee well, thou art a gallant youth. I am proud to be Sir Roland's son. Hmm. Let us go thank him and encourage him. If you do keep your promises in love as you have exceeded them in sport, your mistress shall be very happy. Wear this for me, one also out of fortune. Shall we go, cuz? Aye. Very well, fair gentlemen. Can, 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 can I not say thank you? He calls us back. <laughs> Did you call, sir? You have overcome more than your enemies. 
Will you go, cuz? Have with you. <laughs> Fairly well. <laughs> Orlando, thou art overthrown. Or Charles, or something weaker, masters thee. <laughs> Monster, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. Of what the duke is, I cannot speak. Uh, of, of which of the two were daughter to the duke? The smaller. The other, daughter of the banished duke, detained by her uncle to keep his daughter company. But of late, he had taken displeasure against her, and in all my life, his mouth may break forth against her. Good day, sir. <laughs> Very well. Thus must I from smoke unto smother, from tyrant duke unto tyrant brother. But heavenly Rosalind. Uh, is it possible that you should fall into so strong a liking with Sir Rowland's youngest son? The duke my father loved his father dearly. Doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? Oh, let me love him for that. And do you love him because I do? But look, here comes the duke. Mistress, get thee from our court with safest haste. Me, uncle? You, cousin, if within these ten days thou beest found near our court, thou diest for it. Father, it was your pleasure to have her stay in the first place, and now we two are inseparable. If she be a traitor, why, then so am I. You'll show more bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. Open not thy lips. She's banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my leech. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool, niece. If you outstay your time, then upon my honor, you die. Oh, I pray thee, Rosalind, be cheerful. Knowest not the Duke hath banished me, his own daughter? That he has not. Rosalind, thou and I am one. Shall we part, sweet girl? Never. Therefore devise with me how we may fly. I'll go along with thee. Whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger it will be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far. Well, I'll put myself in poor and mean attire and smirch <coughs> my face, the like do you. So shall we pass and never stir assailants. Were it not better, because I am more than common tall, if I did suit me like a man? <laughs> and what should I call you if thou art a man? Call me Ganymede. Oh, okay. What will you be called? No longer Celia, but Aliena. Now, let us get our jewels and our wealth together and devise the safest way to hide us from pursuit. Now we go in content to liberty and not to banishment. And now, my brothers in exile, are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Why, here feel we but the season's difference, and this our life finds books in the running, brooks and sermons and stones and good in everything. I would not change it. Nay, nor we, my lord. Happy are those who can translate the stubbornness of fortune, and to so sweet a style. <laughs> Can it be possible that no man saw them go? Uh, my lord, uh, the princess is a gentlewoman, or heard your daughter and her cousin much commend the wrestler that did foil to Sidney Charles and she believes he is surely in their company. Go, find me his brother Oliver. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly. Bring again these foolish runaways. What about you, master? What a world is this? Why, Adam, what's the matter? Your brother Oliver have uh, heard your praises and this night. He means to burn the lodging where he used to lie. I overheard him. Do not enter this house. Why, wouldst thou have me go and beg my food? I'd much rather endure my brother's malice. I have five hundred crowns that I have saved. Here, this I give you. Let me be your servant. Though I look old, yet I am strong and lusty. I'll do the service of a younger man. Oh, good old man, we'll go along together. Oh, how weary are my spirits! 
spirits. I can disgrace my man's apparel and cry like a woman. But I must comfort my weaker vessel. Therefore, courage, Shallyhen. I cannot go no further. Well, this is the forest of Arden. Look you, a young man and an old in solemn talk. Oh, Corin, that thou knows how I do love her. I can partly guess for I have loved ere now. Oh, no, Corin. Being old, thou canst not guess. For if thou hast not stood, as I do now, wearing thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Oh, Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. Joe, Joe, this shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. Go question young man if he can give us some food. I faint almost to death. Good oh. evening to you, friend. Eh, and to you, gentle sir. I pray you, canst thou find us a place where we can rest and feed? Here is a maid much oppressed. Oh. I wish I was more able to relieve her, but I am a shepherd to another man whose flocks and cottage and pastures are now on sale. I pray you then buy the pasture, the cottage, and the flocks, and thou shalt have the wherewithal from us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place and would willingly spend my time in it. <laughs> Go with me. If you like the soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I'll buy it with your gold. <laughs> thyself a little. If this force yield anything, I'll be with thee presently. Here, I'll bear thee to some shelter. Thou shalt not die for lack of dinner. <laughs> I think Jacques to be transformed into a beast. I can nowhere find him like a man. Go, seek him, will you? He saves my labor by his own approach, my lord. <laughs> you and son. You and son. You can. Well, bear need no more. Why? I have eaten none yet. And thou shalt not till necessity be served. He dies or touches any of this fruit. <laughs> till thy my affairs are answered. What would you have? Your gentleness shall hoop us more than your force. I almost die for food. Let me have it. Sit down and feed and welcome. Oh, oh pardon me, but there, there's an old man who many a weary step hath traveled with me. Till he first we supply some, not touch a bit. Go, find him out, and we will nothing waste. I thank ye, be blessed for your good comforts. <laughs> <laughs> this wide and universal theater presents us with pageants more vocal than our own. <laughs> All the world's a stage, and the men and women players on it. One man in his time plays many parts. At first, the infant in the nurse's arms, then the schoolboy, the lover, and the soldier. Then the round-bellied justice, and the lean and slippered pantaloon, his voice piping and whistling. Last of all, is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste. Songs, everything. <laughs> Fall to. I will not trouble you with questions. If you are the good Sir Rowland's son, be truly <coughs> welcome him. Good old man, thou art right welcome, as thy master is. Here, uh, support him by the arm, and come to my cave. <laughs> Not seen 
thy brother sends? <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir, that cannot be. Find thy brother wheresoe'er he be. Bring him dead or living within a twelvemonth, or return no more. Thy land and all that thou call thine, we shall seize into our hands. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. Push him out of doors and make an accident upon his house and lands. <laughs> Oh, Rosalind, soon every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtues winced everywhere. <laughs> All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind. <coughs> <laughs> Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosalind. Oh, here comes my sister reading. Tongues are hang on every tree that shall civil saying show, and they will Rosalinda see, teaching all that read to know that Rosalind of many parts by heavenly synod was devised. <laughs> Didst thou not? Hear these verses? Oh, yes, I heard them. And didst thou not wonder who should hang and carve thy name upon trees? Is it a man with a chain that thou once wore about his neck? I prithee who? Oh, Lord, is it possible? Nay, but who is it? It is young Orlando oh. that overcame that wrestler, and your heart burst in an instant. Did he ask for me? Does he know I am in the forest in man's apparel? Or oh, does he look as fresh as he did the day he wrestled? <laughs> How did you find him? I found him under a tree like a dropped acorn. He was furnished like a hunter. Oh, ominous, he comes to kill my heart. Soft, <laughs> comes he not here? Tis he. Slink by and note him. I will play the knave with him to what? Do you hear, Forrester? <laughs> Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is it o'clock? Uh, you should ask me what time of day, for there's no clocks in the forest. <laughs> Where dwell you, pretty youth? Here in the forest with this uh, shepherdess, my sister. There is a youth that haunts this forest, abusing our trees by carving their barks. <laughs> if I met him, I would give him some counsel. I pray thee tell me, for I am he. Are you also he that hangs verses on the trees? I am. And are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Words cannot express how much. Love is merely a madness and deserves a whip. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, and I would set him every day to woo me. And I would be changeable, now like him, now loathe him, until I had driven him from his mad humour of love. And I would cure you, if you were to call me Rosalind, and come every day to my cottage to woo me. <laughs> I will. Where is it? I'll show it to you. Will you come? Yes, pretty youth. And nay, you must call me Rosalind. Sorry. Come, sister. Shall we go? <laughs> Phoebe! Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellst me there is murder in mine eye. Well, now I frown on thee with all my heart. Now, show the wound mine eye hath made in thee. Sweet Phoebe, you shall know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. Well, till that time, come not thou near me. Until that time, I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you? Who might be your mother, that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretch? You <laughs> foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her? Tis not her gloss, but you that flatters her. You, woman, down on your knees, and thank heaven for good man's love. Take his offer, and take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. <laughs> oh, I had rather hear you chide than this man. Uh, do not fall in love with me. I like you not. <laughs> Shepherd, fly her hard. I must <laughs> to my flock. <coughs> oh, 
Who ever loved that love not at first sight? Sweet Phoebe, pity <laughs> me. I would have you. Silvius, time was that I hated thee. But since that thou can talk of love so well, I will endure thy company. Knowest thou that youth? Not very well. He hath bought young cottage. There are some women, Silvius, that would have gone near to fall in love with him. For my part, I neither love him not, nor hate him not, and yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him. I'll write to him. A very taunting letter. Come. But why did he swear he would come this morning, and comes he not? Nay, certainly. There is no truth in him. Do you think he is not true in love? Yes, when he is in love, but I think he is not in. You heard him swear downright he was. What was is not is. He attends here on the Duke, your father. I met the Duke yesterday. He asked what parentage I was. I replied I was good as he, and so he laughed. He let me go. Oh, but what talk we of fathers when there is such a man as Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses. He speaks brave words. He swears brave oaths, and he breaks them bravely. <laughs> what do you got here? Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Ah, uh, now, Orlando, where have you been all this while? I come within the hour, dear Rosalind. In love, and break an hour's promise. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. <laughs> what would you say to me, and I your very own Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. <laughs> Nay, you had better speak first, and when you are graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? Then begins a new matter. Am I not your very own Rosalind? I take some pleasure to say that you are, because I would be thinking of her. Well, in the, her, then in her person, I say, I will not have you. <laughs> then in my own person, I die. <laughs> no, the poor world is almost six thousand years old, and never once has a man died for love. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. <laughs> but come, I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition. Ask me what you will, and I will grant it. Then will you love me? Yes, I will. Fridays, Saturdays, and all. And wilt thou have me? Are you not good? I hope so. Then, sister, come, no. be the priest, and marry us. <laughs> you must begin. Will you, Orlando? <laughs> Will you, Orlando, have to life this Rosalind? <laughs> I will. Nay, you must say, I do take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I do take thee, Rosalind, for wife. <laughs> and I do take thee, Orlando, for husband. <laughs> what would you say to her? How long would you have her after you possessed her? Forever and a day. I say a day without the other. Maids change when they become wives. I will weep for nothing when you are disposed to be merry and laugh like a hyena when you are inclined to weep. But will my Rosalind do so? She will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Oh, she would not have the wit to do this. Shut the door on a woman's wit and it will fly out the keyhole. Oh, with your no for these two hours, I must be with the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I'll be with thee again. Uh, by my troth, if you come one minute behind the hour, I will think you most unworthy of her you call Rosalind. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my very own Rosalind. <laughs> you have misused our sex in your love crate. Oh, my pretty little cuz, how fathoms deep I am in love. I'll go seek the shade and sigh a while till he come, and I'll sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Past two o'clock and no Orlando. Oh, I warned you, he hath gone to sleep too. But who comes here? Oh. My gentle Phoebe bid me give you this. I guess it hath an angry tenor. <laughs> she says I am proud and lack manners. This is a letter of your own device. No, I, I protest. 
Phoebe did write it. Come, come. She has a housewife's hand. This is a man's hand and his invention. Why, thou godhead laid apart, warest thou with a woman's heart? If thou dost my love deny, then I'll study how to die. Alas, poor shepherd, wilt thou love such a woman who makes thee her instrument and plays false strains upon thee? Say this to her, that if she love me, I urge her to love thee, or I will never have her. But go, for here comes more company. Good morrow, fair ones. <laughs> know you where lies a sheep coat fenced out with all the trees? Tis yonder, but at this hour there's none within. I know you too by this description. The boy is fair and of female favor. The woman low and browner than her brother. <laughs> Orlando commends him to you both, and to the youth he calls Rosalind, he sends this. Oh, what must we understand by this? When Orlando left you, he promised to return within an hour. In the forest he beheld a ragged man sleeping oh. on his back. A lioness lay waiting oh for the man to stir. Pretend. Orlando approached and found it was his elder brother. I have heard him call the same brother the most unnatural amongst men. And well might he do so. But did Orlando leave him to the hungry lioness? Yes. He purposed to, but his kindness made him give battle to the beast, in which struggle I awaked. Are you his brother? Was it you he rescued who did so oft contrive to kill him? Twas I, but tis not I, being converted. But for the bloody napkin. He led me to the duke who gave me fresh array and committed me unto my brother's love. I stripped his arm where the beast had torn some flesh away oh. and then bound it up and recovered. He sent me to give this message to excuse his broken promise and to give this napkin now died in his blood to the shepherd youth that he in sport calls Rosalind. <laughs> oh, oh, Many swoon to look on blood. There is more. It's get it, get me, get me. Oh, would I were at home. He'll lead you thither. <laughs> you lack a man's heart, youth. I do so, I confess. I pray thee, tell your brother how well I counterfeited to swoon. That is no counterfeit. Let us go. <laughs> Haste thy steps, Silvius. Is thy love so laggard? Yon youth shall not escape my biting scorn. Come. Is it possible that on so little acquaintance that thou shouldst love her? I love Aliena, and she loves me. If you consent, all my father's house and revenue I will estate upon you, and I will live here as a shepherd with her. You have my consent. Let the wedding be tomorrow. Go prepare your Aliena, for here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. Uh, my dear Orlando, did your brother tell you how well I counterfeited to swoon when he showed me your napkin? I am greater wonders than that. Uh, oh, I know. For no sooner had your brother and my sister met that they loved. Aye, the wedding shall be tomorrow, when I must feel heavy at heart to see my brother have what I wish for most. So tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind. I can live no longer by thinking. Then I will weary no more with idle talk. I can do strange things. And tomorrow, when your brother marries Aliena, you shall be married to Rosalind. It is not impossible to set her before your eyes tomorrow. Speaks thou in sober meaning? By my life, I do. So. Bid your friends and put you on your finest array, for tomorrow when your brother marries Aliena, shall you be married to Rosalind. But look who comes here. Youth, you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not. You are followed by a faithful shepherd. Look on him, love him, he worships you. Tell us, youth, what tis to love. It is to be made all of sighs and tears, passion. Adoration, all deservings. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for no woman. If this be true, why blame you me to love you? But who do you speak to? Why blame you me to love you? To her that is not here and doth not hear. <sighs> no more of this. Tomorrow meet me all together. I will marry you if ever I marry a woman. <laughs> I will satisfy you if ever I satisfy a man. And I will content you if what pleases you contents you. So, fare you well. <laughs> Thus 
thou believe, Orlando, that this youth can do all that he hath promised? I sometimes believe and sometimes not. You say if I bring your Rosalind that you will bestow her on young Orlando here? That would I, if I had kingdoms to give with her. And you say you'll have her if I bring her? That would I, were I of all kingdoms king. And you say you'll marry me if I be willing? That would I, if I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you will give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. So is the bargain. <laughs> now, Orbis, tomorrow meet me all together, and we, I will make these doubts all even. <laughs> <laughs> I do recall in this shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favor. My lord, the first time I ever saw him, methought he was a brother to your daughter. <coughs> but this boy is for forest born and taught in many desperate studies and tutors of his uncle, reported to be a great magician of the forest. Magician? Of what sort? Uh, since youth, I've traveled through these very woods. And certain. Let oh. holy silence reign, for the god himself approaches. Good duke, receive thy daughter. I have from heaven brought her, that you might join her hand with his, whose heart within her bosom is. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. Why then, my love and you, I'll have no husband if you be not he, nor e'er wed a woman if you be not she. <laughs> Peace, ho, oh, I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here are six who must take hands to join in Hyman's bands. You and you no cross shall part. You and you are heart in heart. And you. <laughs> to his love must accord. <laughs> or have a woman to your law. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Wait, let me have audience. Let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick had raised a power to take his brother here and put him to the sword. Oh my. And to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where, meeting with an old religious man, he was converted from his enterprise. Oh. His crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all their lands restored to them that with him were exiled. Oh, welcome, young man, thou offest fairly to thy brother's wedding. To one, a, a dukedom. The other, his lands withheld. Ah, but first in this forest, let's do those ends that here were well begun and well begot. And after every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us shall share the good of our return fortune. Till then, let's give ourselves to revelry. Ah! And you, brides and bridegrooms all, with measures heaped in joy, to the measures fall. <laughs>
Our next performance is A Midsummer Night's Dream, two scenes, Act 1, Scene 2, and Act 3, Scene 2, by Jericho Hall. Uh, those of you who know the uh, version of Henry V with Kenneth Branagh and Much Ado About Nothing will have enjoyed the score by Patrick Doyle. Uh, Jericho Hall has its own Patrick Doyle in Jake Hughes, who has composed the music to accompany this performance. As you can see behind me, the streets of 1950s New York have given way to an enchanted forest somewhere in Athens, where a motley crew of nobodies gather about the Duke's Oak, roaring like lions and causing a stir. Led by an irascible Peter Quince and distracted by an equally unpredictable Nick Bottom, the aspiring actors receive their roles and resume their frolicking through the Athenian wood. Elsewhere in the forest, a regal fairy king and his mischievous messenger pass the time by plotting, devising, and conspiring against two Athenian couples. However, their schemes go wrong, and one love potion later, the two men, Demetrius and Lysander, now attempt to woo the same woman. Unfortunately, Helena, the object of all this newfound love, considers this a mockery. Hermia, in contrast, is callously shunned by Lysander. Predictable chaos ensues. A Midsummer Night's Dream, performed by Jericho Hall. Is all our company here? Uh, you, you were best to call them generally, man by man, uh, according to the script. <laughs> yes. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on their wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most <laughs> cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Oh, very good piece of work, I assure you. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Mm -hmm. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready? Uh, name what part I'm for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. Ooh. <laughs> what is Pyramus? A lover? Or a tyrant, eh? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Oh. <laughs> that. That will last some tears in the troop before me, not it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Uh, here, Peter Quince. <laughs> Flute, you must play Thisbe. Ooh. What? Well, what, what is this be? A wandering knight? Ah, oh, it is. <laughs> it is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Uh, uh, nay, faith, let me not play a woman. <laughs> I, I have a beard coming. No! Oh! <laughs> That is all one. You shall play to the mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let uh. me play this be too. <laughs> <laughs> I will speak in a monstrous little voice. This be. This be. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Lovely dear, thy thisbe dear, and lady dear. Oh, 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 oh. No, no, no. You must play Pyramus and flute. You thisbe. Well, proceed. 
We're often stopping the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Stobling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. Ah, you must play Pyramus's father. <laughs> Myself, <laughs> Thisbe's father. Snout, the joiner, you the lion's part, and I hope you're as a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray for me, give it me, for I am so steady. Uh, you may do it ex tempore. For it is nothing but roaring! <laughs> Let me play the lion too. <laughs> I will roar you that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar you that I will make the dude say, Let him roar again. Let him roar again. I believe you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Dutchess and the ladies that they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. <laughs> that that would hang us. Every, Every mother's son. son. I, I, I grant you, friends, that if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. <laughs> but I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dog. <laughs> I will roar you. And for any nightingale, <laughs> You may play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely, gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must need play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. <sighs> What beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. <laughs> I will discharge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange tawny beard, or your pur mm. your, <laughs> your purple ingrained beard. <laughs> masters, masters. Here are your parts, and I am to request you, and treat you, and desire you to know them by tomorrow night. And meet me in the palace, water mile without the town, by moonlight, and there will we rehearse. We will meet, and there we will rehearse, uh, most obscenely and courageously. <laughs> Take pains, be perfect, adieu. Oh, um, <clears throat> at the Duke's Oak, we meet. Enough! Hold or cut bowstrings. Here comes my messenger, 
How now, mad spirit? What night will now about this haunted grove? Robin, good fellow, hark, hark! My mistress with a monster is in love, near to her close and consecrated bower. When she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for Theseus's natural day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort who here was presented in their sport forsook his seat and entered in a break when I did him at his advantage take an ass's nose I fixed on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Anon this this beat must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. <laughs> when at his sight <laughs> this fellow's pride, and at our step, here or nor what falls, he murder cries, and help from Athens calls. I love the mob, this distracted fear, and love sweet pair of us translated there. But in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked and straight away loved an ass. <laughs> this falls out better than I could devise. But hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juices I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked, of force she must be hide. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you, him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter. On your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being shoes o'er in blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. It cannot be that thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim. So should the murderer look as bright, as clear as as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere? What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. Oh. <laughs> out, dog, out, cur, thou drivest me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? You spend your passions on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead, for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, then tell me that he is well. And if I could, what should I get, therefore? <laughs> A privilege to see me no more. And from thy hated presence, heart I so, see me no more, whether he be dead or no. <laughs> There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I must remain. For sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow for debt. The bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe. <laughs> what hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite, and laid the love juice on some true love sight. About the wood, go swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens, look thou find. All fancy sick is she, and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion, see, thou bring her here. I'll charm his eyes, against she do appear. 
I go, I go, look how I go, sweeping in the air with the torches fall. She goes, she goes, look how she goes, sweeping in the air with the torches fall. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Then will two at once woo one. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me. That be fall preposterously. <laughs> but why should you think that I should woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, when I vow, I weep. And vows being born in their nativity, all truth appears. Why should these things, why should these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. But truth kills truth. Oh, devilish holy prey! These vows are Hermia's. Will you give her or? I had no judgment when to her I swore. Nor none in my wind. Now you give her or. <laughs> okay. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you! <laughs> oh, Helen! <laughs> Goddess, nymph, perfect divine! <laughs> to what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Oh, crystal as buddy! Oh, how ripen show thy lips, those kissing cherries, tempting grow! Oh, hell! <laughs> now I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. Can you not hate me as I know you do? But you must join in souls to mock me too? You are men, as men you are in show. But you would not use a gentle lady so. You're both rivals and love Hermia. And now, both rivals. To mock Helena! <laughs> you are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. And, and now, with all goodwill, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up my part, and yours, <laughs> yours, of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia. I will not. If e'er I loved her, all thy love is gone. My heart to her, but uh, as guestwise sojourned. And now to Helen it is home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest thy peril <laughs> thou abide it dear. Look where thy love comes. Yonder is thy dear. Thou art not by my eye, Lysander, found, but my ear, I think, it brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? <laughs> Lysander's love, that would not let him bide, and fair Helena, who more gilds the night, than all you fiery orbs and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Does not this make thee know the hate, hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? 
Thou speaks not as thou think. It cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. And I perceive they've conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injures Hermia, most ungrateful maid. Have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent? Will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men <laughs> in scorning your poor friend? Tis not friendly, tis not maidenly. Our sex, as well as I, may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face? You've made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious, <laughs> celestial. <laughs> wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul and tender me for his affection, but by your setting on, by your consent. I understand not what you mean by this. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well, it's partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. No, stay, stay, gentle Helena, and hear my excuse. Excellent. My love, my life, my soul, my soul, fair Helena. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. <laughs> Thou canst compel no more than she entreats. Thy strengths have no more threat than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee. By my life, I do. And I swear by that which says I love thee not to prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. <laughs> Quick, come. Lysandra, where to Tenzel? Away, you fobbing, hell-hated, flaxen wench! <laughs> oh. No, no, he'll but seem to break loose, take on as you would follow, and yet come not. You are a tame man. Go, <laughs> head off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing. Let's loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What changes this sweet love? Thy love. Thy love. Out! Out, Tony Tartar, out! Out! Loathed medicine. Oh, hated potion hence. Do you not jest? Yes, Susan, so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her, kill her dead? <laughs> Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. <laughs> what harm can thou do me greater than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Oh me, what news, my love? And not I, Hermia, are not you, Lysander. I am as fair as I was erewhile. <laughs> since night you loved me. Since night you left me. Oh, the gods forbid, in earnest shall I say. In I, and by my life, never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, be out of hope. Be out of question, of doubt, be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love. Hold it up. No, me! <laughs> you juggler, you caper blossom, you thief of love, was beat up by a knight and stolen my love heart from him. Fine, in faith. Have you no modesty, no. No maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness. What? You tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue. By, by your gotta make a puppet, you puppet. <laughs> <laughs> Why so? Aye, that way goes the day. 
Now I perceive she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth. She hath prevailed with him. And have you grown so high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and low? How low am I? Speak, thou painted maple. How low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach up. I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Lower, hark again. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia, did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you. <clears throat> Save that in love unto Demetrius. I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you for, for love. I followed him. But he had ten me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurred me. They kill me too! And now, so you will let me quiet go to Athens while I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go! You see how simple and how fond I am. Why, get you gone. Who it's that hinders you? Foolish heart that I leave here behind. What with Lysandra? With Demetrius. Oh. <laughs> Be not afraid. She, she shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, and she's angry. She is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. No, she be but little. She is fierce. Little again, nothing but low and little. Will you suffer her to flout me thus? Come, let me at her. Get you gone, you dwarf! <laughs> you, you, you minimus of, of hindering not grass maid! You, 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 you bead! You, you acorn! <laughs> you are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Speak not of Helen. Take not her part, for if thou dost intend never so little show of love unto her, thou shalt abide it. <laughs> now she holds me not. Follow, if thou darest, to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow. Follow, nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. Mistress, this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you. I nor no longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a prey. My legs are longer, though, to run away. <laughs> I am amazed and know not what to say. <laughs> this is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest. Or else committest thy knaveries willfully. <laughs> Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far, the lameness proved my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far, my glad it sordid sword, as this their jangling, I esteem a sport. <laughs> Crush the servant to Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from thence all error with his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and then I will her charmed eye release of monster's view. And all things shall be peace. <laughs> Wherefore art thou 
thou, proud Demetrius, speak thou now. Here, villain, ride and ready, where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to labor ground. Lysander, speak again. Thou run away, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush. Thou, where dost thou lie thy head? Thou coward, art thou dragged into the scars, telling the bushes thou looks for wars, and wilt thou come? Come, recreant, come, thou child. I'll whip thee with a rod. He's defiled and draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow thy voice. We'll try no man from here. He foes before me and still dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. Oh, the villain is much lighter healed than I. I followed fast, but the faster did he fly. That fallen am I into dark and uneven way. <sighs> come, thou gentle day. If thou would but once show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Ho, 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 coward, why comest thou not? Abide me, if thou darest. For well I know thou runnest before me, shifting every place and darest not stand, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. <laughs> Nay, then, thou mockest me. Thou shalt buy his dear, if ever I thy face. By daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this, this cold bed. But by day's approach, look to be visited. O oh, weary night, O oh, long and tedious night, abate thy hour, shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight, from these that my poor company detest. And sleep, which sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye, steal me a while from mine own company. <laughs> Yet but three, come one more, to have both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad, Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. <laughs> never so weary, never so in woe, dabbled with dew and torn with briars, no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest till break of day. Heavens, shield Lysander if they meet a fray. On the ground sleeps a I look right to your eye. I look right to your eye. Gentle lover remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest pretty light in the sight of thy former lady. Every brow and groan that every man should take his own in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his prayer again, and all.
Our final performance of the evening is a condensed adaptation of Much Ado About Nothing, performed by Malta Hall. Uh, this is a play of contrasting courtships, and it invites us to ask which is preferable. It shows how nothing, hopes, fears, rumors, lies, tricks, deceptions, and masks influence the way we live our lives and the decisions we make. And in this play, it is the foolish who shame the wise, which is the paradox of the gospel. As Don Pedro, Benedict, and Claudio return from war, hero Leonardo's daughter catches Claudio's eye. Everyone tries to get Benedict and Beatrice together, and Don John does his best to ruin everybody's day. Much Ado About Nothing, performed by Malta Hall. Don Pedro comes here tonight. He hath bestowed much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Um, is Signor Benedict returned from the wars? Hey, madam, and as pleasant as ever. But how many men hath he killed? For I promised to eat all of his killing. <laughs> He's a good soldier, lady. Do not mistake my niece. There is a kind of merry war between Benedict and her. He hath scarce enough wit to keep himself warm. <laughs> I see, lady, he's not in your books. Oh, if he were, I'd burn my study. <laughs> but who is his companion? He's most in the company of Claudio. God help Claudio. Oh, here come the gentlemen. Oh. Ah! Signor Leonato! Oh, you've come to meet your trouble. Don Pedro, you never brought trouble. Be happy, lady. You are like your honorable father. Ah, my dear Lady Disdain, are you yet living? Disdain cannot die when she hath such food as you, Signor Benedict. I would my horse had the speed of your tongue. Uh, Claudio, Benedict, my dear friend Leonato hath invited us to stay here for at least a month. Welcome, Don John. Now that you are reconciled to your brother, I owe you all to you, man. I thank you. I'm not many words. <laughs> Benedict, didst thou know Signor Leonardo's daughter? She is the sweetest lady I ever looked on. I hope you have no intent to turn husband, Claudio. I would scarce trust myself if Hero would be my wife. What secret hath held you two here? He is in love with Hero, Leonardo's daughter. God forbid. God forbid it should be otherwise. That she is worthy, I know. <laughs> that I love her, I feel. That I do not know why she, nor any woman, should be loved. Nor why they should be worthy, is my opinion. And I will live a bachelor. <laughs> Ere I die, I will see thee pale with love. With sickness, with anger, with hunger, my lord. Not with love. <laughs> In the meantime, tell Leonato I'll not fail him at supper. I fly the herald of your will. Hath Leonato any son, my lord? No child but hero. Do you love her? My mind is full of soft and delicate desires. <laughs> All prompting me how fair a young hero is. And yet my liking might too sudden see. I know. We will have a reveling tonight. And in disguise, I will tell her that I am Claudio and I will take her prisoner with my amorous tale. And to her father I will break. And the conclusion is, she shall be thine. Come. <laughs> Antonio? Antonio? Oh, brother. Oh. Strange news. A man of mine <laughs> heard the prince discovered to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter, and meant to acknowledge it to her tonight in advance, and then break you of it. I will acquaint my daughter that she may be better prepared. Go you and tell her of it. Why are you so sad, my lord? I cannot hide what I am. Yeah, you must be sad. Yay, <laughs> yeah, but you must not make a show of it. You stood out against your brother, but he has taken you back, and you must smile in the summer of his grace. I am not a flatterer. I am a plain. Dear and villain, seek not to alter me. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. One news, Baraccio. 
I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Which foe will betroth himself on which way, look, see? Young Claudio on young Hero, Leonardo's heir. How know you of this? I heard Don Pedro agree to O'Hara for himself, and having obtained her to give her to Claudio. This may prove food to my displeasure. <laughs> if I go cross that young stunner, I bless myself in every way. Will you both assist me in for the death of my lord? <laughs> Let us too the great supper and prove what's to be done. Is that Count John here at supper? How tartly that gentleman looks. I can never see him but am heartburned an hour after. He is of a very melancholy disposition. He were an excellent man that would midway betwixt him and Benedict. The one says nothing, the other evermore tattling. I will never get a husband with such a shrewd tongue, niece. I bless God every morning for sending me no husband. I cannot endure a husband with a beard. Thou mayst perchance light on a husband that hath no beard. He that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man, and neither is for me. When I die, the devil will say, get you to heaven, Beatrice. This is no place for you maids. Then off to St. Peter's, who will show me where the bachelors sit, and there we will live as merry as the day is long. Daughter, if the prince do solicit you in that manner, you know your answer. The revelers are entering. <laughs> Lady, will you walk about with your friend? If you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing, I am yours. <laughs> well, I would you did like me. So would not I, for I have many bad qualities. I say my prayers aloud. Well, then the hearers may cry, Amen. God match me with a good dancer. Amen. And God keep me my sight when the dance is done. I know you. Hmm? You are Senior Antonio. Hmm? I know you by the wagging of your head, for he. <laughs> Will you not tell me who told you so? Not now. That I was disdainful, and that I had my good wit out of a book? Well, it was Benedict that said so. What's he? Why, he is the prince's jester. Very <laughs> dull fool. He both pleases men and angers them. And then they laugh at him and beat him. Well, when I see him, I'll tell him what you say. Do, do. So, my brother is amorous on hero, and hath withdrawn a father to break with him about it. That is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. Are you not, Signor Benedict? I am he. <laughs> I pray you. Dissuade my brother from Hero. She is no equal to his birth. How know you this? I heard him swear his affections. <laughs> he swore he would marry her tonight. Let us do the banquet. Tis certain so. The prince woos her for himself. This is an accident of hourly proof which I mistrusted not. Farewell, therefore, Hero. <laughs> Claudio! <laughs> yes? The prince hath got your hero! Did you think he would serve you thus? I'll leave you. <laughs> but that Beatrice should know me and not know me. The prince's fool. Perhaps I go under that title because I am mad. Or so it is Beatrice that gives me out. Well, I'll be revenged. Senor, where's Claudio? I found him here. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the goodwill of this young lady. Beatrice hath the quarrel with you. The man she danced with last night told her that he is much wronged by you. She told me, not thinking that I had been myself, that I was the <laughs> prince's jester, that I was duller than a great thought. I would not marry her. Ugh. All disquiet and perturbation follow her. Look, here she comes. <laughs> Will your grace command me any service to the world's end? 
I would go on the slightest errand to the Antipodes rather than hold three words conference with this hoppy. <laughs> Have you no employment for me? None but to desire your good company. <laughs> oh, sir. Here's a dish I love not. I cannot endure, my lady. Tongue. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Once before, he won it of me with false dice. Therefore, your grace may well say I have lost it. Um, here is Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. How now, Claudio? Why are you so sad? Or, or are you sick? Neither, my lord. Well then, be happy. I have wooed in thy name. Fair hero is one. I have obtained the goodwill of her father. Name the day of the marriage, and God give thee joy. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give myself away for you. Speak, cousin. Or, if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> you have a merry heart, lady. My cousin tells him that he is in her heart. And so she doth. <laughs> <sighs> Thus goes everyone to the world but I. I may sit in a corner and cry hi-ho for a husband. Will you have me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I might have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. Uh, I pray you pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. There was a star dance, and under that was I born. Cousins, God give thee joy. A pleasant and spirited lady. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, if they were married a week, they would talk each other mad. <laughs> Claudio, when mean you to go to church? Not till Monday, which is about seven nights. In the interim, I will undertake to bring Benedict and Beatrice together. I would fain have it to match if you three would minister assistance. I am for you. And I. Hero, I will teach you to humor your cousin so that she will fall in love with Benedict. And we three will practice on Benedict. Come, I will tell you my drift. Claudio shall marry Leonato's daughter? I am sick with this pleasure on this. How canst thou trust it? Tell Don Pedro that he hath wronged his honor in marrying Claudio to such a contaminated stale as hero. What proofs shall I make? I told you a year since that I am in the favor of Margaret, the lady hero's waiting woman. I remember. I can appoint Margaret to look out at her lady's chamber window at any time of night. Tell your brother and Claudio, you have discovered that Hero loves me. <laughs> Bring them the night before the wedding to where they can see us at her chamber window and hear me call Margaret Hero. This shall appear such seeming proof of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance and all preparation overthrown. I will put this into practice. And thy fee is a thousand ducats. My cunning shall not shame thee. <laughs> <laughs> I have known Claudio when he would laugh at such shallow follies as love, and now he has become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. One woman is fair, another wise, another virtuous. But till all graces be in one woman, I shall not be so converted. Ah. Here come the prince and Monsieur Le. I will hide. See you where Benedict hid himself? Oh, very well, my lord. 
Leonardo, what was it you were telling me the, uh, the other day? That your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? <laughs> she never did say she would love any man. Most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, who she seemed ever to abhor. I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. She wrote him a letter once, and then, and then tore it into a thousand pieces, and railed at herself that she should be so immodest. Then falls on her knees, crying, Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. I pray you tell Benedict of it, and hear what he will say. Uh, were it good, do you think? Hero says she will die if he love her not. Well, let it cool a while. I could wish Benedict would most modestly examine himself to see how unworthy he is of so good a lady. Oh! <laughs> My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If you do not dote on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. And let there be the same net spread that must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry, and the sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage. <laughs> <sighs> this can be no trick. They seem to have the truth from Hero. <laughs> they say that Beatrice would die rather than so any sign of affection. They say, too, that she is fair and virtuous. <laughs> Tis the <a> truth. <laughs> I will be hardly in love when I said that I would die a bachelor. I did not think that I would live until I were married. <laughs> and the world must be peopled. <laughs> ah, here comes fair Beatrice. I do spy some marks of love in her. <laughs> <sighs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you Come in to dinner. <laughs> Fair Beatrice, I thank thee for your pains. I take no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If you have no stomach, senior, I'll fare you well. <laughs> <sighs> Against my will, I am bid to send you come to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. <laughs> and I took no more pains for these things than you took. That's as much to say as any pains I take for thee are as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity on her, I am a villain. Is over. her. I'll make her come, I warrant you, presently. Now, Ursula, your part is to praise Benedict. Mine is that he is sick in love with Beatrice. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice? <laughs> so say the prince and Claudio, but she cannot love disdain and scorn ride sparkling in her eyes. And therefore, surely it were not good she knew his love, lest she make sport at us. You speak truth. I never saw a man as wise or noble, young or fairly featured, but she doth turn his virtues inside out. Yet <laughs> Signor Benedict goes foremost in report throughout all of Italy. When are you married, madam? Why, tomorrow, come. 
I'll show thee some attires. She's lying there, weren't you? We have caught her, madam. <laughs> Stand I condemned for pride? Benedict, love on! <laughs> I'll take my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall excite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. <laughs> I will but stay till your marriage is consummated. Then I will go towards Aragon. I will ask Benedict to come with me, for he is on there. <clears throat> Gallants, I am not as I have been. He is in love. And I know who loves him. I warned one who knows him not. Mm. Senor, walk aside with me. I must speak words to you that these hobby horses must not be. <laughs> On my life, to break with him without Beatrice, even so. I will speak with you, brother. Claudio may hear, for it concerns him. What is the matter, brother? This lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Disloyal? Go with me tonight, and you shall see her chamber window entered the night before her wedding. If you still love her, then wed her. But it would be better to change your mind. May this be true. I was sure enough. If I see anything tonight why I should marry her, I'll, I'll shame her in the congregation. I will join you to disgrace her. I will discourage her no further till you are my witnesses. Let the issue show itself at midnight. George the Cole, you are thought to be the most senseless and fit man for the constable of the watch. Therefore, bear your lantern. You shall charge all Vagor men and bid them stand in the prince's name. How will you not stand? Why, let him go. If you will not stand when he is bidden, he is none of the prince's men. True. And you are to call out all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed. How they will not? Why, let them alone till they are sober. And if you meet a thief, let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. You have always been called a merciful man, partner. True. This is the end of the charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. One word more, I beg of you. Watch around Signor Leonardo's door, for wedding being there tomorrow, there's great quail tonight. Come, neighbor. Well, we hear our charge. Let's sit upon this church bench until two, then to bed. Horrors! <laughs> We're not. I have earned a Don John, a thousand ducats. Some treason. Stand close. This I'll uh, hear somebody. No, it was the main on the house. I have tonight wooed Margaret, the Lady Hero's gentlewoman, by the name of Hero. And the prince and Claudio and thy master saw all this far off in the orchard. Oh, and thought they Margaret was the Hero? The prince and Claudio did, but my master the devil knew all. <laughs> Claudio swore they would shame her the next morning before the whole congregation and run away enraged. We charge you in the prince's name. Stand. Let us call upon the master's possible. Not masters, masters. Never speak. We charge you. Let us obey you to go with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll obey you. <laughs> What is it, my friends? 
Mary, sir, our watch tonight had ta'en a couple of as errant knaves as any in Messina. And have this morning excommunicated before your lordship. Take their examination? Examination yourselves, and then bring it to me. I am in great haste, as may appear to you. Fare you well. My lord. They stay for you to give your daughter to her husband. I'll wait upon them. I'm ready. <laughs> Come, good partner, to the gaul, and condemn our excommunication. <laughs> <laughs> Come, friar, be brief. Only the plain form of marriage. <laughs> My lord, you come to marry this lady. No. <laughs> to be married to her, friar, you come to marry her. <laughs> lady, come you to be married to this count? I do. If either you know any inward impediment why you should not be so conjoined, I charge you here upon your honor here to utter it. Know you any, hero? None, my lord. Know you any, count? <laughs> I dare make his answer. None. Stand by, dear friar. Will you give me this maid? As freely, son, as God gave her to me. And what might I give you in return to counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Then, Leonato, take her back again. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. My lord, if you and your I own know fruit. what you would say, but I never tell you. As a brother to a sister, I showed bashfulness and comely love. And seems I ever otherwise to you? Out on thee! Thou art more intemperate than animals that rage in sensuality. Are these words spoken, or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken, and these things are true. True, oh God! Let me ask her one thing. Bid her speak true. I charge thee do so, as thou art my child. What man was it that spoke with you out at your window yesternight betwixt twelve and one? I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Myself, my brother, and the count did hear her confess with the ruffian of the vile encounters they have had in secret. Hath no man's dagger here a point for me? Oh, oh, wait, how do I hear We must seek you down. Let us go. These things smother her spirits up. How doth the lady? Dead, I think. Help, uncle! Here I am! Uncle, see you better than fire! Of comfort, lady. Just the help of God. Wherefore should she not? Because death is the fairest cover for her shame. She was mine. Mine I loved, mine I praised, mine I was proud of. Oh, the wide sea hath drunk too fear to watch her tainted flesh! Oh, on my soul, my cousin is the lie! Would the two princes lie, and Claudio lie, who loved her, hence from her, let her die. Hear me a little, call me a fool. Trust not my reading, nor my observation, if this lady lie not guiltless here. Lady, who is he you are accused of? Nay, know that you accuse me, I know none. <laughs> There is some strange misprison in the princes. If their wisdom be mislied in this matter, the practice of it lies in John Bastard. Let my counsel sway you in this case. The princes did your daughter leave for dead? Then publish it that she is dead indeed. What will this do? When the Claudio hears that she died upon his words, she will appear in the eye of his soul, more moving, delicate, and full of life and he will wish she had not so accused her. But success will lay it out better than I can, in all likelihood. I flow in grief. The smallest twine may leave me. Tis well consented. Come, lady, die to live. <laughs> <clears throat> I do believe your fair cousin is wrong. Oh, how much might the man deserve of me that would write her? This man's office, but not yours. I love nothing in the world as well as you. 
Is that not strange? <laughs> I was about to profess I loved you. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Ah. <laughs> not for the wide world. Farewell. Tarry, sweet Beatrice. There is no love in you. Let me go. We'll be friends first. Then fight the man who had dishonored my kinswoman. Oh, would I were a man. I would eat his heart out in the marketplace. <laughs> Talk with a man in the window. Oh, that I am a friend would be a man for my sake. By this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that Claudio hath wronged, hero? As sure as I have a soul. <sighs> Enough. I will challenge him. Now, go comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. Farewell. Let the offenders come before the master constable. What is your name, friend? Borachio. <laughs> Yours, Sirrah? I am a gentleman, and my name is Conrad. <laughs> What's his name? Accuse these men. This man said he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady Hero wrongfully, and that Count Claudio did mean, upon his words, to disgrace Hero in front of the whole congregation and not marry her. Oh, villain! Hero was in this manner accused, and upon grief of it died suddenly. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Let these men be brought to see you only in arms at once for examination. <laughs> My soul doth tell me heroes belied. And that shall Claudio know, and all that do dishonor her. Here come the Prince and Claudio speedily. Hear you, my lords. We have some haste, old man. Thou dost wrong me, thou dissembler thou. Thou hast so belied my innocent child that thy slander has gone through her heart, and she lies buried, slain by thy villain. Away, I will not have to do with you. Thou hast killed my child. Thou killest me, boy, thou shalt kill a man. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death, but she was charged with what was fully proved. I will be heard. Yeah. See, see, here comes the man we went to seek. Welcome, senor. Welcome. You are a villain. Now, I jest not. I will make it good. How you dare, with what you dare, when you dare. You have killed an innocent lady, and her death shall fall heavy upon you. Now let me hear from you. He is in, in, in earnest, and he hath challenged you. Did he not say my brother had fled? Uh, how now? Two of my brothers been found, and Baraccio won. What defense have these men done? These fools heard me confessing to this man how your brother incensed me to slander the Lady Hero. How you saw me court Margaret in Hero's garments. And how you disgraced her. The Lady is dead upon my accusation. And I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. But did my brother set thee upon this? And paid me richly. Sweet Hero. Thy image doth appear as when I saw thee first. Art thou the slave that with my breath hath slain my innocent child? Yea, even I alone. Not so. Here stand a pair of honorable men. Third is fled who had a hand in it. I thank you, lords, for my daughter's death. I know not what to say. Choose your revenge. I too would satisfy this good man. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. But my brother's daughter is almost a copy of Hero, and she's heir to us both. Give her the right you should have given my daughter, and so dies my revenge. O oh, noble sir, I do embrace your offer. Until tomorrow morning, then. Just for your pains, go discharge your prisoners. God keep your worship. Take these slanders back to jail. Until tomorrow morning, lords. Farewell. Farewell. Well, 
<laughs> Did I not tell you that fair hero was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio. And Margaret, who knew not what it was she did that night. Well, I am glad that all things work so well. <laughs> and so am I. Else I must fight Claudio. Ladies, withdraw from us until I send for you, and then come hither back. The prince and Claudio have promised by this hour to visit me. Brother. <laughs> uh, you must play father to my brother, to my daughter, and give her to you. I shall do so with confirmed countenance. <clears throat> Signor Leonardo, your niece regards me kindly, and we too wish this day to be conjoined. For which, good friar, <laughs> we shall desire your help. It shall be yours. Here come the gentlemen. Good morrow, lords. Claudio. Are you prepared to marry with my brother's daughter? I am. Call her forth, brother. Here stands the prior ready. Here stands the prior ready. Which is the lady I must seize upon? The same as she. I do give you her. Sweet, let me see your face. Not till you have sworn to marry her. Give me your hand before this holy prior. I am your husband, if you like with me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. Another hero! The hero that is dead! <laughs> when after that the holy rites are ended, I shall tell you largely of fair hero's death. But now, let us to the chapel. <clears throat> Soft and fair, friar. Which is Beatrice? I answer to that name. What is your will? Do you not love me? No more than reason. Do not you love me? No. <laughs> no more than reason. I'll be sworn he does. Here's a sonnet written in his hand, fashioned in <laughs> And here's another written in my cousin's hand, fashioned unto Ben. <laughs> Come, our own hands against our hearts. I yield upon great persuasion and pardon to save your life. For all Peace! Of I will stop your mouth. <laughs> Come, we are friends. Let us have a dance to lighten our hearts ere we are married. My lord, your brother John is taken back with armed men back to Casino. Think not on him till tomorrow. Strike up, Pipers! <laughs> Results are in, and they are unanimous. Uh, I'd just like to say my own uh, personal comments uh, of appreciation for the, the effort that the students have put into uh, rehearsing and practicing. Um, the, the freshman year are particularly well represented in this year's cast, uh, and they've done a great job as well with the set design and costumes uh, to make this evening uh, such a wonderful occasion. However, uh, <laughs> not, not everyone can have first place. Uh, so in third place, the judges have decided uh, to place Ashdown Hall. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, 
Second place goes to Malta Hall. And that means first place, and most importantly, hall points, are awarded to Jericho Hall. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, it would have looked quite silly if there had been no one turning up. Uh, thank you also to Abby Lopez as stage manager and Garnett Lightheart as tech manager, uh, without whom this wouldn't have run so smoothly. Can I invite you all to stand and we'll close with the doxology. <coughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all He had in me. Yeah.